same time that many people do well on it and they stop using um, you know, Vicodin, OxyContin, um, even heroin, and they use methadone long term and they remain eventually on the same dose, they're not addicted. They're using methadone and the, the definition you gave about negative consequences and what I said, lying, cheating, stealing, yes. if those behaviors go away mm -hmm. and someone uses methadone for 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, and they're not actually having those behaviors, their marriage is going well, their job's going well, they're, they're actually striving for new goals, they're not addicted, they're just dependent on the methadone. Okay. But if someone actually stockpiles it yeah. or buys it on the street, which is yeah. common, and takes too much, they risk dying. Right. Uh, but also, can it affect, now, people that, are, that use heroin, and I know all, all the people that I'm talking about are going through thirty to $40,000 worth of dental care. I mean, their teeth completely okay. decay. Sure. Now, can that, you know, we're talking about methadone, can teeth decay during methadone? Can, is there any other uh, side effects that could be harmful for their body, for their internal organs, their liver, other parts of their body? What can it be doing? I mean, we're, when, when you're on any kind of drug, um, and I am also on a prescription drug, and I, I am going to be going through $30,000 worth of dental care sure. because it has, this is a, a drug that I'm supposed to take for my body because mm -hmm. my body doesn't manufacture enough and it's ruined my teeth, okay? Mm -hmm. So what, so these drugs have to do something to the body. Right, so the most important thing they do is they suppress people from breathing. So the brainstem has us all breathing naturally without thinking about it. It's called autonomic nervous system. And we all breathe um, every day and stay alive. These opioids, whether it's pain pills by prescription or heroin, go straight to the brainstem and the bra tell the brainstem, don't breathe anymore. So what the folks do is they actually um, slow down their breathing, go into a coma. They have about 10 minutes uh, in that state where they're non-responsive, and then they die. Um, the medications such as what we're talking about can cause hepatitis, long term they can cause kidney disease, mm -hmm. severe constipation, they mix with other drugs and cause other further problems you such can as get alcohol. He hepatitis C you're talking about. Absolutely. Uh, a, friend, a friend of mine just recently died from it mm -hmm. and she got, she was getting a blood transfusion right. and apparently maybe they used bad needles or something went wrong in that blood transfusion at a hospital sure. and she died of hepatitis C. Sure. And hepatitis C is a real big issue right now. It is. So the, the issue with hepatitis C is, um, is a little bit different um, other than those who are injecting heroin. So if you're injecting with needles into your body, you're risking getting hepatitis C, um, HIV, hepatitis B, and other illnesses. Uh, people get necrotic skin, they get wounds that never heal, they basically will have boluses of um, thrombi, which are clots, traveling to their heart, to their brain, and getting strokes. So we see all sorts of problems with folks who are injecting, and that's what leads some people to believe in uh, what we call harm reduction via clean needle programs, and that's a whole other topic. Well, you know, why are the message of what's going on, you, you're, you're talking about all these things, and I mean, if I, you know, if anybody knows all these things, they wouldn't even, they would be afraid to take a, a simple aspirin. Mm -hmm. This should be at the elementary school system that this should be talked about. So the kids, when they get into uh, high school, when a lot of these things start to happen, they'll know what is going wrong. Even with, we, we talked earlier, uh, uh, this, at lunchtime we talked about the e-cigarettes, those electronic cigarettes sure. that, that, that are very dangerous. The FDA, I think FDA, and I just saw an article that FDA is coming out with uh, are the beginning to regulate e-cigarette uh, in the e-cigarette industry, right. which we, which I'm going to have you come back to the show. We're going to sure. talk about e-cigarettes, and they, and that has you, we talked about formaldehyde in it. Right. Formaldehyde. In, what is formaldehyde? Vapors, and in the vapors, what is formaldehyde? Oh, well, they use it to embalm bodies. And when we did our um, gross anatomy in, in medical school, and we were actually, um, you know, going and dissecting cadavers, they were all actually. Um, you know, preserved with formaldehyde. Yeah, it right. smells so strong when you walk in that lab. It's actually carcinogenic. It's a horrible compound to be breathing in, and that is what vaping and uh, e-cigarettes bring in. Let me just say, long overdue, uh, those of us who know about the FDA and know about addiction have been calling for the FDA to regulate e-cigarettes and this vaping for a long time, and the, e the FDA has been extremely slow to do it. 
I'm going to pat them on the back and say, thank God they're doing it now. It should have been done a long time ago. What about these stores? And there was a new one that just came up in Highwood, a vaping store. You go mm -hmm. in there. I went in there. I didn't know what vaping was. <laughs> I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. How, what, what, why are they being allowed to open up? There, it's, and they should be regulated. Sure. I mean, it's just like sun tanning booths. Sure. I mean, how dangerous it is for kids. And, this, and who's, take, who's using the e-cigarettes? Our children, right. high school kids. Junior high. No I question. even read junior high are, are right. using it. What is going on? Okay, so so first of all, I want to go back to something you said before because you made me so incredibly happy, okay. as you did at the Bluegrass restaurant <laughs> when I had my delicious salad. But I'm going to say this to you. Um, you just mentioned the fact that we have to think about children, uh, you know, 8, 9, 10 years old and educating them. You're totally right. That is something that I say every time I do a panel discussion around Lake County, every time I'm interviewed by a newspaper, that is the answer. We do need to treat folks who are already in addiction. We need to control them and maintain them in recovery throughout their life. We're not going to cure them. But the real answer to this problem, this epidemic, is starting when someone's five years old. Teaching a five-year-old what addiction is is simple. It's not hard. You can tell them three or four sentences. Then when they're seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, first of all, we should be screening them for mood disorders, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, even PTSD. And then basically post -traumatic treating them. Post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, kids, kids can have that from a number of reasons. And so ultimately. Parents if, getting divorced. Oh, yeah, yeah. Being, you know, they're neglected. There's right. uh, abuse in the family. Basically, if we could actually diagnose and address those problems when they're adolescents, with or without medication, we don't have to get into that. But the right. bottom line is someone has to listen to that child, understand about their insomnia, their anxiety, their mood swings. Then basically by the time they're 11, 12, 13, and they're starting to dabble in marijuana, e-cigarettes, vaping, alcohol, they'll already know when you've educated them mm -hmm. their risk. And part of that is getting a family history. So our pediatricians, um, I'm not going to bash them, but I'm going to say that they could do a better job, partly if they had more time, to actually talk to the children about family history and the, uh, and the mm -hmm. parents. If there's a family history of al alcohol addiction, of someone who's had serious mental illness, suicide, other things, then you can look back to the child and say, there's a set of genes here, maybe an environmental component. You're potentially going to be more at risk than your friends. So when you're at that bar mitzvah, age 12, and everyone goes out back and starts passing a joint around, you need to think about so the fact that So that's what they do you, at a bar mitzvah. They do. And you might, you might think about the yeah. fact that, you know, I'm not going to promise you that child won't try it, OK? Peer pressure is very powerful. Mm -hmm. But maybe when they have their puff or two, they'll say to themselves, I know that I'm at huge risk for this. And I want to be a ballerina. I want to be a sports star. I don't want to lose that opportunity, so I'm not going to go down that road. We're not doing that now, and that's the most important thing we could do. Now, now your, your organization is OR, right? Well, my, um, my, my um, organization in my office is called ORS. It's Opioid Addiction Recovery Services. And we treat um, folks Are you doing some training there, too? Yeah, we train, and we basically have um, counseling sessions. We um, are allied with Live for Lolly, which is a wonderful activist group out of um, Arlington Heights. And basically, what we do in my office is um, tailor the treatment to the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, since I'm board certified and also board certified in internal medicine, I try to look at the whole picture. A lot of the time, these folks who are addicted go into uh, treatment programs for 28, 30 days. They're uh, given uh, antidepressants, other medicines, without even being told what this pill is and what the diagnosis and is. They don't really do, and they don't do a good diagnosis. They no. Do, it's or it's, it's some, a, co a cookie cutter. Right. Everybody gets the right. same thing. And they thing. don't know what they have, so they come out hating pills. And the, the reality is if you explain it and you tailor the treatment, patients do well when they have uh, a motivation. Well, you were talking about doctors, and I want to get back to this. How can we get doctors to s uh, stop prescribing these type of drugs? So you're asking a million dollar yeah. question. So first and of all, the drug companies yeah. coming in right. to sell the doctors in their office. Right. You know, they don't sell them. They just they hand them out, actually. Right. Per perfect two questions go together. So first of all, physicians are poorly trained or not trained at all. Okay, I went to a wonderful medical school and, uh, you know, an Ivy League med school. I was almost not trained at all on uh, how to prescribe uh, prescription pain pills, opioids. I was not. And the fact is that the only reason I became board certified is that I, um, I saw the problem and one of the drug companies uh, actually held seminars to train us and they have a motivation, but I don't care. If I can help people, I'm glad that they're training us. Ultimately, doctors are not giving the education. So a law was recently passed in Washington. 64 of the approximately 125 medical schools 
that, you know, that's, that's med schools throughout Canada and the U.S., okay. are now going to have about a three-hour course that all those med students in those, you know, half the med schools must take to graduate. It's sorely, un, like, underrepresented. We need to have, like, like a semester uh, in just several just of the in years. Just pharma right. psychopharmacology. Right, so the docs need to learn mm -hmm. psychopharmacology better. They need to learn about um, how to prescribe properly, mm -hmm. and then basically even in residency and fellowship. So it doesn't matter whether you're a plastic surgeon, a dermatologist, a primary care doctor like me, you have to have familiarity with it. Now the other side, so docs are coming out not trained. They're drug companies. I love your, uh, your statement because you're exactly right. Purdue Pharma, and I'm going to call them out because there was recently an expose in the LA Times, and folks should Google it and read it. Purdue Pharma makes a, a number of um, strong opioid painkillers, and basically the one that they made um, a long time ago was uh, OxyContin. Now, OxyContin is the pill that pill for pill is the most likely to cause addiction of any opioid. When you say addiction, when does the person become addicted? Do they get addicted after one or two pills, a mm. week full of pills? Because remember, they have just come out of the hospital. Sure. Maybe they had a knee replacement, sure. a shoulder replacement, a hip replacement, and that's the first thing they give you. They give you these drugs. Right. Is it, how do you get, do you get hooked on it? When? Right, so, so the addiction won't take place until the person's been on it long enough that their behavior starts to change. That usually takes months, okay? Um, but the fact is that they may, from the very first dose, make a decision that they're going to take this every day. They love that pill so much from one dose. That's about 6% of the population. So what happens is we do surgery. We should be giving folks three to five days of, of opioids, whether it's, um, whether it's uh, prescription pills of Dilaudid or Vicodin or Norco, three to five days, and then quickly switching them to non-opioid medications. So it should be just a few pills in the bottle. Correct. And it then should, no refills. No refills. Right, it shouldn't right. even be 30 pills. Right. It should be 10 pills. Right. But I've had patients who go into the emergency department with a sprained ankle. Mm -hmm. They get 40 Norco for a sprained oh. ankle. So the fact is that there's a lot of reasons. You know, physicians are graded on patient satisfaction. They really mm -hmm. don't want someone calling at 2 in the morning uh, complaining about their pain. They're not thinking about the consequences. And so what happens is they get so that that's medicine. The consequences. Right. So the patient gets the medicine. They like it. Like mm -hmm. I was saying, that's a formal term, drug liking. Then they find a way to take more and more. They get their refills or they have a lot already. And ultimately what they'll end up doing is becoming um, really tolerance. Tolerance means the dose you've been taking is no longer working. Right. You need more. OxyContin causes uh, t tolerance very quickly because it was marketed by Purdue. They sent people to doctor's offices saying it's a 12-hour drug. Use our drug. It's given once in the morning at 8 a.m., once at night at 8 p.m. It's so simple. And Tens of thousands of doctors were prescribing it, thinking, okay, this is simple. Actually, and, the they drug get, and they couldn't get their patients off well, of it. It was only working for yeah. six hours, though. So it was wearing off after six. Mm -hmm. And patients were saying, I want refills, and the doctor was right. saying no. So now they turn to the street, and they're buying it on the street. And now they're getting more and more. So basically, the first mm -hmm. step is tolerance. So they need more and more to get the same effect, or they go in withdrawal. And then the next step is dependence. So they have to have it. So they, when the doctor should prescribe, if they're going to prescribe something like that, immediately they prescribe something that they can reduce That's it. That's correct. And so they, they, a they different drug. Correct. They, yeah. get, they give yeah. them both at the same time. Like a regular, like a Tylenol. Just That's a plain well, Tylenol. Well, Not right. even with codeine. Just a... Yeah, um, Tylenol and uh, Advil tylenol. or Aleve. Yeah. You can take them right. together. They're right. synergistic. Also, and you've got to be careful with sleeping pills because right. a lot of people with sleeping no pills... No question. And they take these, pers these pain medications um, and they can... They can really pass sure, away. Know, they could die from it. It's a terrible effect. Right. You know, patients may be drinking alcohol to excess and we don't know it. I right. can test for it on my urine drug test that I send out, but most doctors aren't going to do that. But so sleeping pills, let, uh, right. because p people that are middle aged or, or older, mm -hmm. they start taking sleeping pills and they're on all these other drugs Correct. and it, it, it's, it could be deathly right. for them. You're right. Now, the thing is that. And, I, and, I, right. and I see our credits are starting to go oh, down. And, um, <laughs> so much more to say. I mean, there's so much more to say, and I'm going to invite you back with we really. I'm wrapping up, and um, and I, we're, there's so much to say on this because we're just hitting it. There's so much. I mean, we, I really like to talk about more on e-cigarettes, what we can do, mm -hmm. what you know, what.